Hello everybody! This turned out to be one of those weeks where I somehow find myself with no video scheduled. So I looked over a list of favorite movies that I haven't reviewed yet, and there are quite a few, and this title jumped out at me as a well-loved film that's waited long enough for its spotlight. I have referenced it once or twice, I talked about it for a few minutes in a different video, a much older video, but I've never reviewed it. So today we're going to spend a few minutes, or maybe a little more than a few minutes, discussing a classic from 1942, Random Harvest. The film is a romantic drama from MGM, it was directed by Mervyn Leroy, and stars two of the loveliest actors of Hollywood's golden age in my opinion, Ronald Coleman and Greer Garson. The story, set in England, begins in November 1918. Coleman plays an amnesiac soldier injured in World War I who is battling a speech impediment and shell shock in addition to not knowing who he is. He's been in rehabilitation in an asylum where he's been given the name Smith. He's out for a walk one night when news of the armistice is declared. In their excitement, two guards accidentally leave the gate open. Nervously, Smith steps out into the world, where he's soon overwhelmed by the party atmosphere. He ducks into a tobacco shop, where he encounters Paula, a kind young woman who helps him avoid getting picked up again by the asylum guards, and takes him under her wing. Yearning to help him, and feeling a forced return to the asylum wouldn't be the best thing for his recovery, Paula decides to whisk him away to the country, taking him up north to a quiet little village. Over the course of time, they fall in love and marry, but something happens that changes everything. I won't give any more of a summary than that at this point, because this is a film that has some twists. It covers a span of several years, about a decade I'd say, and it goes through a couple phases, and I don't want to give those away to anyone who hasn't seen the movie and is thinking that maybe they would like to. I will discuss the rest of the film in some detail later on, but I don't want to get into that just yet. The story is about memory loss and tragic reversals, it's about the search for identity and a sense of belonging, it's about faithfulness in the face of disappointment, it's about sacrifice and resiliency, and it's about hope. Random Harvest is based on a book of the same name by James Hilton, which I have not read, at least as of this moment that I'm filming this video. These two stars were not strangers to Hilton's work. Coleman played the lead in the 1937 adaptation of Lost Horizon, and Garson made her feature film debut as the love interest in the 1939 adaptation of Goodbye Mr. Chips. In addition to Coleman and Garson, the film features Susan Peters and Philip Dorn, with Reginald Owen, who's popped up in several things I've watched this year, and, very briefly, Henry Travers and Una O'Connor. I will be perfectly honest with you and state that a big reason why I love this movie as much as I do is because I love Ronald Coleman. He is one of my biggest actor crushes, has been for years. I could tell you all the reasons why I love him, but, uh, well, we're trying to have a sensible discussion here. <laughs> and this is one of his best performances. Smithy's circumstances call to mind the fact that Coleman himself fought in the Great War and was wounded. He received a shrapnel injury to his ankle that left him with a slight limp. Not that you can tell, like other actors of that time who had old war injuries, he worked hard to disguise it. Though, perhaps in this film, more than any other, he let it be a little more evident, as Smithy is described as having a tendency to shuffle. The sole criticism I will allow, and I don't even like to say it really because it's not an issue for me, is that Coleman is a little old for the role in the first part of the film. He was born in 1891, that makes him 51 here, playing a soldier who's referred to as a young man. It's not the most convincing thing, especially because I know what he looked like when he was a young man. Personally, though, I don't find this a difficult hurdle to get over. And yes, I admit that I am biased, and I can't picture anyone else in the role. I only mention this because I feel I have to. He looks just fine to me. Actually, he is a major, so he wasn't a kid in the trenches. 
That plus the age of his potential parents suggests he could be around 35 at the start, and if the plot spans 15 years or so, he would be just the right age when the film ends. Leading Lady Greer Garson, who, by the way, is 38 here, if you can believe it, is always a pleasure to watch, and likewise, this is one of her best performances. Although she was knocking it out of the park in the 1940s, the year before this, Garson had appeared opposite her frequent co-star Walter Pidgeon in the moving film Blossoms in the Dust, also directed by Mervyn Leroy. 1942, the year of Random Harvest, also saw her give her Oscar-winning performance as Mrs. Miniver. It was a very good year for Garson. A word I often use to describe her, and it's not just her looks, but her entire screen persona, is luminous. And she's truly radiant here. Her portrayal of Paula is so warm and gentle. She's a sympathetic figure who is both strong and fragile at the same time. This is one of my favorite couplings on film, these two lovely actors who had remarkably elegant diction and I enjoy the irony of casting one of the greatest voices of his generation as a man who struggles to speak. But they're both also remarkably expressive actors, and I love the moments of nonverbal communication in this film. It's one of my favorite things about it. I end up riveted to the screen watching their body language, their posture, um, and the subtle changes in their face that are sometimes even barely perceptible, that reveal their unspoken thoughts. In the first part of the film, the two characters seem like opposites. Smithy is a lost soul, insecure and dependent, like a child or a puppy. Enter effervescent Paula. She's bubbly and encouraging without being offensive or overwhelming. She's just what Smithy needs, really. Her vitality is on fullest display in the song and dance number at the dance hall, performed with gusto in costume with a thick Scottish brogue. Admittedly, Garson's singing isn't great, but it's lusty, and you've gotta love her for going all in. But as energetic as she is, she has a gentle, easy way about her, and a nurturing instinct. Smithy can't help but be carried along on the tide of her warm, accepting nature. I love how she keeps scooting her chair closer as he's struggling to answer her questions, and as she listens to his story, she's moved to tears. I love the simplicity of their relationship as it develops, with her checking in on him, lightly teasing him, but always in a positive way. With her help and encouragement, Smithy overcomes his speech problem and begins to pursue a living as a writer. The picnic proposal scene is adorable, where after she accepts him, she playfully has to remind him to kiss her because otherwise he'll just keep happily munching on his sandwich. There's an endearing sweetness about the way they are with each other, the way he lights up when he sees her coming down the aisle, the way she looks after him by checking over his suitcase after he's packed it. We get these precious little moments establishing how good they are together. And then... Here's the first possible spoiler, so consider yourself warned. I don't normally go through an entire film like this, but so much of what I want to talk about, the characters, their emotions, their quandaries, is in the second half. So if you'll indulge me, the first big twist comes when Smithy leaves home for the first time and goes to a job interview. While away, he's hit by a car, and the shock of the impact restores the memory he lost, mentally sending him back to the war. He identifies himself as Charles Rainier of Random Hall. He's lost the last three years. Smithy is gone. He has no recollection of Paula, their newborn baby, or their cozy life together at the cottage. I have no idea how realistic this is. Maybe it's the most far-fetched concept imaginable? Maybe it isn't. Strange things do happen with the human mind. This is the first of many moments in the second half of the film that make me respond a certain way, not with words, but with a sound kind of like, ugh. Charles's only connection to the past is a key, which he carries around with him, though it means nothing. 
He enters the family business and becomes so absorbed in it that he spares little thought for that period of time he has no memory of, except that occasionally he's troubled when he hears or sees something that rings a bell. It's at this point that Susan Peters enters the film in a prominent supporting role as Kitty, Charles's niece, who isn't actually a blood relation. She's only part of the family by her father's marriage to Charles's sister. I need to clarify that for reasons you'll understand in a second. Kitty is a 15-year-old schoolgirl when she first meets Charles, but she's already infatuated with him, waiting on him and trying to impress him with how sophisticated she is. She grows up as time passes, and then there she is, a smartly dressed young woman waiting for him in his office. The interesting thing about Kitty is how open and honest she is. There's something plaintive about how she practically begs him to adore her when she knows he doesn't love her the way she has always loved him. But she's stuck. She'll never be satisfied with anyone else, and she's determined to have him. They get engaged, and that leads us to... Spoiler for anyone who's still watching who cares about spoilers, twist number two. And I love how this reveal is filmed. We hear the voice, but we don't make the connection. We hear a name, Miss Hansen, and it doesn't mean anything. It's not until a slow pan to the door reveals that Miss Hansen is Paula, working now as Charles's secretary. Ugh! I know this is just a movie, but when I imagine the excruciating pain of seeing your long-lost husband every day and working with him in close proximity and him not recognizing or remembering you... <laughs> and to make it worse, there's Kitty flirting with him and, and he flirts back with her and it's right there in front of her and she even encourages them to go out to lunch together. Ugh. I feel conflicted about this because it's such a humiliating, heartbreaking situation. He's so near and yet so far and I just feel like, Paula, why are you putting yourself through this torture? But I also feel it's courageous of her to sacrifice her own happiness so she can continue to keep an eye on him, something she promised him she would do. Pay attention to her face when she's watching him look at the pictures of a place that means something in their previous life together. Watch how she reacts when he says he's glad she came to work for him. Ugh. And then he tells her he's going to get married. Ugh. She maintains her composure marvelously. And then he jokes that he hopes she won't follow his example and get married herself because he doesn't know what he would do without her. Ouch! Around Charles, she's always efficient and professional Miss Hansen. It's in the scenes where she confides in Philip Dorn's character, the sympathetic doctor who was helping Smithy at the asylum, who has now become her friend, that she reveals her bottled up grief and need and jealousy. I love this midpoint reversal, what I refer to as the switch. In a way, it allows Garson and Coleman to play dual roles. Miss Hansen and Charles Rainier are very different from Paula and Smithy. Margaret Hansen is more demure and restrained than Paula was. She's also older. She's a woman who has been through a lot, who has suffered and struggled, and who now spends her days suppressing her emotions and tamping down her anguish. She's concealing her own identity and her knowledge of Charles's past so as not to hurt him. There is a fair amount of misery in this story, I suppose. Some of it self-inflicted. She could leave, she could just let him live his life and move on with her own. I think she wants to be near him in case his memory comes back she wants to be there for him. I think she loves him so much that she wants to be there to help him in any case. But with the news of the engagement, she does something that... I don't know that I would be able to do in her position. Rather than forcing the truth on him or trying to drive Charles and Kitty apart, Paula makes a selfless decision that frees Charles to marry so he won't unwittingly be guilty of bigamy. But Kitty is also unhappy. Susan Peters gives a solid performance as the persistent love-struck teenager, but it's the poignant moment in the chapel where she really shines. 
From time to time there are little things that happen that cause a minute echo in Charles's memory. Kitty catches him in such a moment, and he startles her with an empty stare, as if she's an intrusive stranger. And she has the maturity to admit they're making a mistake. She confesses her doubts and tells him she reminds him of someone else, someone he loves and will always love more than her. Peters earned an Academy Award nomination for her performance, and she so distinguished herself in the part that it launched her from supporting ingenue roles to dramatic leads. Unfortunately, her life story is a tragic one, and I've spoken of it before. Early in 1945, she was injured in a hunting accident that left her wheelchair bound. She did make a triumphant return to the screen in 1948 with the noirish drama The Sign of the Ram, and she did several stage plays, but her life was not what it had been, and Peters passed away in 1952 at age 31. This scene in the chapel is a shining moment in a promising career cut short too soon, and with her vibrant yet insecure performance, she makes an impression in the film and leaves her mark in classic film history. Kitty's words and his own dissatisfaction, a hunger for what he suspects he has lost, though he can never put his finger on it, send Charles to the place where he regained his memory, and Paula follows him there. But the sight of his old, unclaimed luggage is meaningless, and he dismisses the clothes as humble rags, Paula beside him silently watching, knowing, wishing, hoping. More time passes, Charles goes into politics and finds that his secretary is indispensable to him. There's another carrot dangled in front of us when he confesses that he had a strong feeling when he first saw her that they'd met before. She had no idea about this, so they're both hiding something from each other. It's after that admission that he proposes marriage, unaware that it's the second time, but his offer is one of friendship and support. He sees them as being in the same boat. They've both lost someone and are alone, and he needs her. Why not make a life together? He assures her, though, there would be no emotional demands. Ugh. This moment is so hard. The potential of having that perpetual nearness to him that married life would bring, but to be told that it would be like a business arrangement. He describes it as a merger. Woo! Again, Paula seeks counsel from Philip Dorn's character, a complicated issue for him because he happens to have fallen in love with her himself. The film doesn't spend much time on that, it's alluded to a little bit. We don't see how they met, or how he became her confidant. I wouldn't have minded seeing a little bit more of that story. She goes ahead with it and the film jumps forward again. They're considered an ideal couple and everything's fine, except it isn't. Here's Paula, against all odds, married again to the love of her life, except he has no clue who she really is and doesn't really love her. He's kind, he's faithful, he's complimentary, but it's not the same. Loving someone who doesn't feel the same way about you is always painful. Knowing he loved you once before and he doesn't remember must be frustration on top of heartache. At this point in the film, I feel like someone's standing in the bleachers, yelling at Charles, urging him to remember. Paula maintains an admirable facade, but during this scene, it slips. Her unhappiness bothers him, and we see a tiny ray of sunshine, like maybe there's hope here, but Charles's sensitivity actually leads him in the wrong direction to ask if there's anyone else, and to say that if ever anyone else came along... Ugh, that's almost too much for her, and there's a pathetic moment where she holds the beads he gave her before up to her face, trying to trigger his memory, and she even goes so far as to suggest the woman in his past might be her. It's the closest she ever comes to telling him, and he just smiles in amusement. <sighs> She decides she needs a break, it's time to take a little trip abroad, alone, which also bothers him. Another hint that maybe his feelings are a little warmer than, than he thinks they are. But first, she's going to visit a little place up north. 
They part ways at the train station, both feeling regret over the separation. And this leads to the final sequence where everything, at last, starts to come together. He winds up in Melbridge, which is where the film began, where he left the asylum and met Paula. Everything lines up to mirror that night, the joyous atmosphere, the thick fog, and memories begin to creep in. With difficulty, he starts the challenging journey back, following his own trail bit by bit until it brings him to the old cottage with the squeaky gate, the low-hanging bough, and the door that swings open once he's unlocked it with the key he's carried all these years. He doesn't know that his wife's journey has brought her to the same place, and she's waiting eagerly, tearfully, watching him hesitate. Remember at the beginning I mentioned posture and body language? This is my favorite physical reaction. Smithy. There's a beat while he's figuring it out, and then you know it's all come back when he relaxes and smiles, almost sheepishly like, it was you all the time. I had no idea. And he says her name, her real name, and rushes into her arms. And I can't help it. I end up crying because, ugh, the journey is so difficult and has so many heartbreaking moments. But this reunion is so beautiful. And they're so happy and joyful. And somehow, in spite of everything, in spite of all those challenges and all those moments where I was just ready to tear out my hair, it was worth it. This is one of my favorite endings. I love this movie. I don't rewatch it often because I do find it a little draining, I suppose. I do feel for the characters so intently, um, but the performances are effective and the storytelling is powerful and I love the way it's photographed. And the ending I have rewatched many times. Many, many times. <laughs> It's a lovely film. I think I've used the word lovely three times in this video, and I encourage you to check it out if you've never seen it, especially if you're up for a tear-jerking romance. If you have seen it, I would love to hear what you think of it, so please share your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll be back again soon with a review of something entirely different, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks for watching.